Hello everyone, Linker here with the AFK Arena podcast featuring the people that make the community what it is. And I would not sleep on our next guest today. Will you please introduce yourself? Hey guys, Insomnia here with Furry Hippo Gaming. All right, and Hippo is an experienced gamer playing since the days of Mario, going through World of Warcraft, and now my understanding is you're into mobile games, is that right? Yes, yes, finally got to just mobile games, played World of Warcraft for about 10 or 12 years. Um, and now this is my passion. That's huge because I also used to like those RPG games and then I just got drawn into all this gacha kind of side of it. Yeah, I, I feel the exact same. I, I played through a lot of games and once I started playing AFK Arena, this is the one that stuck and it's been ever since the beginning. I hear you. I hear you. So Hippo is making a lot of content for AFK Arena. Check it out. Subscribe to Hippo and I'll give you the reasons why in just a second. But first, before we dive into the tips on his channel and the, the recent impromptu Q&A, which he made, I want to talk about who you are outside of the game. So who you are, what do you do? Um, actually, in banking, I have a master's degree in finance. So it kind of led down that road with banking. Um, have two kids, as you guys have seen in some of the videos when they come in, and really busy, mm -hmm. spent many, many years in the military, traveled the globe, been to Central America, South America, Africa, Europe, um, kind of everywhere throughout my travels. It's been pretty busy all in all. I hear you. I hear you. Definitely seen your kids. They're very cute. How old are they? Uh, six and four. Oh, so exactly like that age benchmark where they start being somewhat independent so you can get back your own life, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And with COVID <laughs> happening, it kind of changed the whole school dynamic because now everyone is homeschooled or essentially virtually schooled. Mm -hmm. um, also, one thing I was always curious about is uh, your name, like Fairy Hippo or Insomnia. These are two different ones. I never got like, how did that come to be? Insomnia goes way back to the days of Ultima Online. I don't know if a, a lot of the listeners might not even know Ultima Online. Or it may not have been born at that time. <laughs> it, exactly. <laughs> Ultima Online, um, that was my, my in-game name. So I've kind of been running with the same group of friends through multiple games. From Ultima Online to Dark Age of Camelot to World of Warcraft, um, we've played a lot of the games together, and that's kind of always been my gamer tag was Insomnia because most of the time when they got up, I would never sleep. So that that is where mm -hmm. the the nickname kind of came from. Do you have like them playing with you right now, AFK? Um, a couple of them did try out AFK Arena. I think there's still a few that play. Um, when I started this game, actually getting recruited by casuals with Newton um, made a whole new batch of friends. A lot of them still play World of Warcraft. Right. Um, a lot of them switch to Diablo 3. Um, we played that for quite a while, so it's kind of split between both of them. Um, but not having quite the time to dedicate to World of Warcraft is why I started playing AFK Arena, because it's a game I don't have to sit down and play for six or eight hours a day because I no longer have the time. I hear you. I hear you. I think a lot of players are one of the most common complaints we have right now is how AFK used to be super casual. And right now with events like Abyssal, it's taking more and more time. The Abyssal does take time, but a lot of the games, you kind of get out what you put into it. So if you really do put a lot of effort into the Abyssal Expedition, you do see the rewards and you see kind of the teamwork. Um, overall, the game, I run multiple accounts on the game, and it doesn't take actually that long to hop on, do the dailies, do the weeklies, complete some of the events. I mean, maybe 15 to 30 minutes a day for an account to actually do everything, including the labyrinth. So it is still a huge, huge time saver versus a lot of the actual games um, similar to World of Warcraft and Diablo. I hear you. Just being able to have something that you do in the offline, like a game that's not as demanding because all these grinding RPGs are so rough with that. And another thing that I think many people are curious about is how did you find out about FK Arena and how did you get drawn from those more PC-oriented games into the ones you're doing now? Um, interesting enough, I, I've said it a few times if you caught the live streams, um, FG3000 actually had like a showcase when this game came out. Um, FG3000 was who got me started on this game. I watched his video from when it first came out. Um, started playing it the same day that I watched his video on YouTube and been playing it ever since. He was the gateway. Then I caught some of Vulcan's videos and then that's it. I've been hooked ever since. But FG3000 was the first one who introduced me to AFK Arena. I hear you. I think FG, like the community owes something to FG. <laughs> I don't think it still plays. Vulcan actually told me the other day on his podcast that he started from FG. Now it appears that you started from it too. Like apparently uh, like... 
if K owes to FG more than they can say. Another thing that I've been really curious about is you have a very hermetic coverage, I think, of the content because you upload so much and you upload about every little piece of the game. I don't think anybody really covers as wide as you do, which is really helpful for those players that really need somebody to be there. I think the community is really earning from it. So as I said earlier, guys, this is the kind of thing, if you want somebody to be there for you every step of the way, definitely check out Hippo and subscribe to him. One thing I did want to ask you though, how do you come up with your videos? Most of it, some of it does come from actual subscribers. So when they give me tips or tricks, things they're looking for, but a lot of it is content that I can't find anywhere else and can't find in-depth answers to questions that I have on AFK Arena. Um, I mm -hmm. absolutely love doing the guides. As you guys have seen, I have a guide for every single one of the Peaks of Time. I cover all of the Voyage of Wonders. Um, it just really seems like the more knowledge you have of the game just makes it much, much easier to play um, without spending so much time to do the research. That's why I love really breaking down the content, breaking down the heroes, the patch, kind of putting my input on what I think it's going to affect and how it's going to change. Um, and then seeing kind of that come fruition when it actually comes out in the progression of AFK Arena. Mm -hmm. One thing I personally, like when I look at your content, let me know if there's something you're aiming for or am I kind of just seeing it. I see that you have uh, the kind of uh, videos that are more guide oriented. So you have the videos that have more information on them. And you have this other side that's more like a challenge or fun oriented. For example, the factional teams that you do or all that side. How do you divide between them? Uh, the big thing between the guides is, again, helping to explain the game. So the faction accounts were actually born because there were so many heroes. When I look at the content and when I look at the amount of heroes that AFK Arena now has to offer, there were a lot of heroes that I had never seen, that I had never built, that I had really no anticipation to build. Um, just like if you caught my mm -hmm. recent video with Rigby, that's mm -hmm. the only time I've ever built Rigby. That's the only time I've ever seen or used Rigby. Um, there, there's this whole class of heroes that players say are just garbage, are the the D, the E level heroes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, do not build them. And I really feel like with AFK Arena, they have a, a certain niche that they kind of fill within the game. And that was the reason for the faction accounts was seeing heroes that I've never built and seeing heroes developed and built actually to their fullest potential to see if they really can perform well. And a lot of them do. I think that kind of spirit really fits inside where you are right now. So of course, Hippo mentioned it earlier, but if you guys don't know, Hippo is now a part of Casuals. And Casuals is a guild that really likes experimentation. We had them on this series before. Newton, I think, has a personal touch in rugby, and some of them really like Satrana. So they also really try all these niche heroes. How do you feel like joining Casuals helped you get access to certain types of information? Um, a lot of times the information is just really, really breaking it down to the mechanics. We have a lot of people in Casuals that have a ton of information. I mean, literally running for PvP, for exam example, with the um, Legends Challenger tournament, running every single formation, every single hero, how many times they were played, what it was, was it a win, was it a defeat, um, what formation were they going against? There is an insane amount of information that you can get on this game, and they bring a lot of it to the forefront, and that is why we really perform really well. With the Abyssal mm -hmm. Expedition, the reason that we came in first on this one was we literally had probably two weeks of planning before we ev ever went in. Before we, the Abyssal Expedition ever went in, we spent days and weeks of planning to make sure that we were going to be number one, what formations we were using, how to start it. Um, even if you've seen some of the early guides content before the Abyssal Expedition ever came up for the third time, we had a game plan going straight in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What aspect of the game do you enjoy the most yourself? Do you like the most campaign play? Do you like the most events or KT? Um, what I like the best, I love the peaks of time. I love the adventures. Um, again, coming from World of Warcraft, coming from Diablo, a lot of it is quests. A lot of it, they have daily quests, weekly quests, monthly quests. The campaign is good, but out of everything that the game offers, I love the events. I love the Abyssal Expedition. It is very, very fun for me. And I do also love all of the voyages and all of the peaks that we have. I think they're the most quest-oriented mechanic we have. Like you go out, you know, you'll receive this item, it'll make you stronger. It's, I think it's a cool reference to like older RPG styles.
Yeah, because a majority of the campaign, you can just run it as much as you want. So essentially, mm -hmm. the pushing through the campaign is relatively easy. You get pretty much your best team of heroes set together, run it 10 times, 20 times, 50 times, 100 times, whatever, until the RNG clicks and you finish the campaign stage, which is what a lot of players do. The campaign doesn't really take very much. It's not very difficult in my eyes, where some of the other parts like the Misty Valley can be a lot more challenging. I hear you, especially with this new Pixel Time. You probably heard of this. Like we have a harder mode of Pixel Time that's going to be Trials of God. I think this mode is going to require the top end of players that want to get the top rewards. It's going to be a harder kind of adventure. So this is one thing really a lot of players will prepare for. And I'm sure a lot of players will turn to your channel for answers. Have you prepared for this event? Um, right now, I cannot view it. I only have one account that is on the test server, and it is not unlocked for me. You actually have to be in Chapter 28 already. I'm on the test mm -hmm. server, I am in 25, so I'm a little bit short of seeing it. As soon as it drops live, I have a lot of content that I want to cover, a lot of what players on the test server have shown with a lot of different sages. I'm super excited for it. I think it'll add a another thing to really add to the depth of AFK Arena. Because if you guys remember when it was earlier, um, we didn't have the voyage. That was just an empty hole. We didn't have the Abyssal Expedition. That was an empty hole actually mm -hmm. on the map of AFK Arena, as well as most of the places here. Um, the rickety cart wasn't there. The Oak Inn wasn't there. The trading hub wasn't there. So they have Oh, that's built the real OG time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have built this game to, to be absolutely phenomenal and, and the depth of it is so deep now and i'm super excited for them to attract a lot of new players because i feel like now the game can satisfy and can really really deliver on the content um where before it was a, a little bit light there wasn't that much to do but now i heard a lot of players are saying there's too much to do so kind of getting <laughs> a happy medium between the two Every single feature that's introduced, I think that's one of the things I see you cover on your channel consistently and very well, is how the meta really changes. And I think people need to be aware of how you really need to make your decisions before these things happen and kind of get an overview before you're too late. Because you see the people right now, and right now we have some furniture knowledge that we didn't have before. Like we know about some furniture pieces that work the way they do, like Scria, for example, is one not many people know. And I feel like those different mechanics is one thing that really empowers creators because the more mechanics they introduce, the more engaging content we can make. And I think the recent ones have been more end game oriented. Do you feel the same? Yes. As you guys have seen, um, most of my accounts, so I have seven accounts that are um, essentially at chapter 25 plus. Um, so, so it is kind of a lot of end game content right now just because it's the only way that you can really showcase new heroes and see how well they perform is when you start getting a little bit further end game um versus having one or two copies there's a lot of heroes here the celestials and the hypogens especially that a lot of players will not be able to see especially if you're free to play for a long time it does take a incredible amount of time to build these heroes but planning for the heroes, planning to build Taylene or the twins and seeing how to effectively use them, I, I feel like is what I hope to bring to my channel and bring to the game mm -hmm. is really the knowledge um, of where these heroes fit, how well they can perform and what heroes you should be using in specific situations. So if I recall right, you did pay a little bit to the game. Was it from like some of it was from the channel and stuff like that? So you probably have some stuff that you can demonstrate that most viewers won't, whether it be some sales hypos that I've seen or those niche heroes like Rigby. I really like that video. You guys should definitely check it out. I didn't want to ask you in the campaign. So what you have these seven accounts, which one of them is the most advanced? Um, The most advanced is still the main account because the main account actually started from day one which interesting enough with the pay to win account, um, just knowing the power of currency, they're already about halfway through chapter 30 at this point. Um, they mm -hmm. have caught up very, very quick with the knowledge that we have today of AFK Arena and the heroes. That, that's kind of one of the big things that a lot of players don't realize is that newer heroes or newer players to the game have a chance to get heroes that we could never get before. For instance, if I did a thousand summons on my main account before all of these heroes were released. There was no chance to get them because back in the day, there was no signature items. Um, there were no wish lists. 
everything was just randomly pulled heroes up to up to the point of the stargazing which again that was just a lot of pay to win if you wanted stargazer cards but the dynamic of the game has started kind of the evolution of the game now you can focus on specific heroes that you want to build on team comps you can build and with my pay to win account you can see that i have Sophia, Iran, I have the Gwen comp, I have the Damon comp, mm -hmm. I have the God tier comp in the course of four months where the first four account, months. the main account has taken year, a year plus to be mm -hmm. able to catch up to the main account that fast. It is absolutely crazy. So the newer account, chapter 30, approaching it, and the older account you've been since the first days of the meta, like you're talking about, I want, I want people to be kind of aware of what era we're talking about. We're talking about not just a year ago, a year and a bit, about August. We're talking about the times that Aziz and Athalia were introduced. At the time, we did not have any of those newer mechanics. So the meta was really completely different. And I think you're right. One thing that you said there kind of, and I, I really feel it, is that at the time, the progression was just way slower because we had access to so much less. So the meta was like Shamira or Brutus or some stuff like that. What's one thing you did like about those times? Um, back then, it was a lot simpler. There, there was mm -hmm. not so much data. There was not signature items. Um, pretty much when you went to the store and you chose the Challenger store, you bought Athalia. That was it. Remember, mm -hmm. we didn't have a lot of the heroes that were in there. We didn't have Red Chest. We didn't have um, Flora. Aziz at that point, nobody ever used. Aziz was a completely dead hero. So everybody in PvP, everybody in the campaign, 100% was Athalia. That was the only hero mm -hmm. worth building um brutus was the king brutus 100%. absolutely dominated everything um back then again before signature items and also rain if you guys don't know rain, rain was my first five star hero um she used to absolutely destroy when it came to riz when it came to a bunch of the boss fights um, because of her skills and abilities yes so so back then rain rain was actually the first hero i believe they ever reworked um, and they reworked her signature item, which was interesting. And it was the first, I believe, the first rework we ever got. I think what wasn't work before that? I don't know. But Rain, they did her signature item. When, when signature items came out, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was her or Brutus. But they didn't do anything with the heroes, nothing with the skills, nothing. But just little tweaks to the signature items. And now it seems like they're doing um every patch, oh, all kinds oh, of heroes are getting. About. Okay, wow, your memory is really good. Like you remember all this AFK history. It's weird how it's wired. I still remember maps from World of Warcraft and maps from Dark Age of Camelot. <laughs> all right, that's pretty intense. And with all this newer content coming out, uh, have you caught on to the new dimensionals? Very, very interesting. I actually didn't know who they were, and a lot of people seemed confused. So they are two heroes from anime, because there's an Overlord game, there's Overlord anime, there's Overlord movies, there's <laughs> a, a bunch of content. So I definitely checked them out. Seems like they are going to be super powerful, and a lot of people who are familiar with them said it's going to be absolutely crazy to, to see them released. And since they've been doing Celestials, Hypogens, and Dimensionals, um, we have gotten a ton of heroes in a very, very short amount of time, which every hero they release is a game changer, honestly. I hear you, especially in the last few releases. Then again, like in recent times, like the last patch, they kind of slowed it down. But what do you feel was a crucial release that happened recently? I think the the big one between uh, Zephyril and Lucrita was pretty big. Um, Ezio, I'm kind of disappointed with overall. Um, doesn't see very much gameplay in many formations. Nakaruru, I absolutely love. If you guys have not seen her on my main account, I have her completely maxed out. And she can single-handedly just destroy teams. Um, the biggest change that I think that they've had in, in AFK Arena was Taylene. And is still Taylene. Cannot wait mm -hmm. to see the frame, cannot wait to see the skin. Um, but when they released her, they completely changed the game. She was the only hero and still the only hero that can be reborn. So can actually die multiple times um, in stages, which, which is game changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear you. I think between her and Rowan, I think these were the two biggest releases. Aaron release, especially to me, kind of struck me on the low note because when he just came out, people were saying he's not as good. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yep. 
Yep, I know a lot of a lot of people are saying that, and a lot of people, like I said, with, with some of the more the rare heroes, um, a lot of players don't see them, and a lot of players don't get to use them. So even if I say, you know, Taylene is the best hero in the game, if you don't have access to Taylene and if you can't build Taylene, um, we need heroes that can replace Taylene essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I've had a theme recently, and he talked about some F2P comps himself. He said. He runs five comps up to chapter 34, I think it is now. Yeah, he just got to chapter 34. And he does like, he broke down five teams with no Talene in them because the men rarely stargazes as FTP, which is was really foreign to me. But I, I heard more and more about it. And he made five teams without Talene to get him through in the campaign. But then again, he does like mad macros and stuff like that. I wanted to hear like also, what do you, where do you stand on that? Like, what do you think about automation of the game? Um, I think the art in this, like the animation is absolutely amazing. It, it's interesting to see when the new heroes come out. I mean, just how absolutely spectacular um, the heroes themselves are. They, they really put a lot of time and effort, not only into the artwork, but a lot of the skills and abilities. And I think they also, before they release, they tweak it a lot to really make it work because you got to remember not only in new heroes, um, how is it going to affect the old heroes? How is it going to affect formations? Um, what is the signature items going to look like? What is the furniture going to look like? Because if they bring heroes that are too powerful to the game, it can very, very easily upset the balance between factions, between the campaign. A lot of stages where one hero can just literally run everything, which they, they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And you see, like, uh, Lilith recently, like, taking this to the next step. So not only do they work on all these new heroes, they also work on all kinds of new collabs. So I feel like the, the front-facing team, not the back-facing engine kind of team, they really started doing work recently. So you see both new skins, new works, and you see also new collabs. So with players like Markiplier, of course, getting into the game, and all these kinds of new people, you have a lot of newer players getting in. What would you recommend to them? Like, what do you think? currently in the end of 2020 is the best thing for those New York players to know. Really, when you start AFK Arena, the, the biggest thing that you can take away, especially from watching videos, um, is knowledge is really power. And, and it is perfect for this. The more that you plan exactly who you want to build, what teams you're looking for, especially because now we have the desired summons, which makes it a lot easier to pick specific heroes that you're looking for. It, it really increases your opportunity or increases your chances of pushing further in the campaign. The faster you push in the campaign, the more experience you're going to get, the more gold you're going to get. The further you push in the King's Tower, the more stargazing cards you can get from the faction towers. It, it's just really about planning the heroes that you're looking for, the teams that you're building. Because if you spend a lot of resources into heroes that are not as powerful or might not be as good of a carry, such as Brutus, such as Shimira, when it comes to late game, a lot of heroes you can use resources in. And that was one of the biggest downfalls when it came to my main account, spreading my resources too thin. So essentially mm -hmm. using too many red chests on heroes, not taking them to uh, plus 30 signature items, but using a lot of amplifying emblems on heroes that I'm not taking to plus 20. So just spreading your resources too thin can be very, very detrimental with this game. And with all these changes to the game, like you see, since the old days that you mentioned to what we have right now, what do you want to see in the game coming up in the future? Biggest thing, and I've said it for months now, even put it all over Facebook, mm -hmm. um, is the ability to remove gear. If you guys haven't yeah. seen the live streams, the videos, um, when you're going through the faction towers, like today, for instance, on Sunday, all four faction towers are open, swapping gear between four different factions, going through the Misty Valley, swapping gear between all of your heroes, then swapping to a core team that you use in your campaign or multiple teams in the campaign. Um, they made a step in the right direction, absolutely with artifacts and allowing up to eight heroes to equip the same artifact. So now mm -hmm. we don't have to swap the artifacts, but the gear we still have to. So if, if I literally just had one button to remove all the um, gear on heroes would be a absolute game changer as far as the amount of time that it takes to switch heroes and switch gear between heroes. I hear you. I think they tried to address it with the reset scrolls. Where do you think that went wrong? The reset scrolls, the biggest disappointment was they never addressed the real issue with factionless gear. When it comes to mm -hmm. factionless gear, um, you can never apply a faction to it. So essentially the gear that does not have a faction 
will just be used for fodder or it'll just be gear that sits there that is never utilized. My opinion, they need factionless gear needs to be able to use the reset scrolls to actually assign it a faction, one of the random factions. That way you can actually use the gear and possibly get the piece that you're looking for. It would be ideal. But as of right now, the factionless gear is just kind of dead gear at that point of nobody using it. And another aspect that I want to ask you about is when you look at PvP, obviously being in casuals, you're exposed to a lot of information. I'm sure you made up your mind yourself with all, your, all of what you know. Um, it has like its ups and downs, right? So you have acts, like you have amazing complicated PvP on the one end that really benefits players that go the extra step with strategy. And on the other end, it's hard to access for a lot of these new players. So what would be your advice to newer players starting to get into it right now? Um, the biggest thing with PvP is looking at specific heroes. There's a lot of heroes that are not dedicated too much or not utilized too much in the campaign. Um, but when it comes to PvP, they do exceptionally well. When you look mm -hmm. at heroes like Thane, when you look at Athelia, um, a lot of heroes that do exceptionally well in PvP, Wukong is another one that does exceptionally Dang. well in PvP. Um, big thing with PvP is pushing it as hard as you can and as often as you can. The higher that you score, the higher your ranking is, the more challenger tokens you get. In return, more heroes you get, more red chests you can accumulate. So just making sure that you're pushing it. A lot of people will leave PvP. So now you're missing out on challenger tokens and you're missing out of the daily rewards and the season rewards because you're not addressing or not playing the PvP aspect of the game. I hear you, but one thing really caught me in the middle there. Um, sometimes you see Wukong, you see Thalia, I see, but Thane I think is a special one. Do you mind elaborating on that? Thane has a couple abilities and, and the big one is being untargetable when he uses his ultimate ability, that, that's kind of the big one. So he can actually have the ability to alt, um, take down an enemy and almost goes into another alt. But when he is alting, he doesn't receive damage. Uh, Thane cannot receive damage while using his ultimate ability. So he can take out sometimes single-handedly teams by themselves, essentially because you can't hit them. You, you can't hit him and he can actually go through an alt, especially when you have him built with his furniture, with signature items. Um, he can alt so fast, similar to a hero like Orthos um, that actually does like the time stop when he attacks. Mm -hmm. They can take out entire teams in, in PvP, which is crazy because you cannot target them. We've seen the addition of Theowin does the same. When she's actually inside of a hero, she is untargetable. Um, and Taylene, of course, I, I go back to her because once you kill her in PvP, if you do not kill the rest of the team fast enough, she's reborn. Now you have to deal with her again, which can be very, very difficult in PvP. So let's say that you have like, uh, oh my God, second language troubles. <laughs> 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 Give me a second. I, I know what I want to say. So what would be the dream comp where Thane works? Like, how would you position, like, what enemies is Thane really good against? Or Theowin, either one of these I think is really interesting to hear. And what would be allies that you'd put with them to enable them? A lot of them is just, it goes back to the energy regeneration. And, and that's what really makes the, the big thing is, again, when Thane alts, he cannot use his, um, or he cannot be targeted. So if you can continuously have him alt, he will just destroy teams which is crazy on how fast he can attack. So for PvP, th there's a lot of different metas, um, especially with like Eron and Laika. They are two of the top PvP heroes. Rowan, mm -hmm. of course, because of his amazing support. Um, Taylene, Aziz, again, Aziz lets you nullify ultimate abilities, which can absolutely destroy teams. He can also add uh, energy to Thane. Yes. Yep. And he adds the energy to Thane. So there, there's just so many heroes in this game now, which is kind of crazy. We've seen Theowin with Ezio and Skreg. Because remember, Theowin, just like Ezio, um, Skreg with his furniture bonuses will go to the enemy side. If Skreg has furniture, he not only increases attack rating, but he does a damage mitigation. If you have his nine piece, energy regeneration. So again, Thane going to the enemy side with Skreg is going to be powerful, which is an unusual team comp, but it works surprisingly, surprisingly well. And Skreg with his furniture has become a vital hero in PvP and a lot of the campaign. Mm -hmm. Skreg with furniture, I definitely like that's one that I've seen a lot and I think a lot of people don't know. Um, another one I think is interesting is because Skreg is so 
re recently risen in popularity so much. Let's say newer players want to invest in them and they don't know, hey, should I go invest my furniture in my upcoming God comp? Should I invest it in Scrag? So I wanted to hear from you actually something interesting that I don't have completely made up in my mind. What kind of newer player arsenal, like what heroes would a newer player have to have for them to benefit a lot from investing in Scrag relatively early, let's say chapter 25 or 26? Um, Scrag, you have to remember, the, the only way to make his furniture work is he does have to go to the enemy side, meaning that you really do need to have his signature item built um, because the signature item allows him to alt faster, allowing him to go onto the enemy side faster. And also remember with his furniture, you only get the benefit on the enemy side. So if you have heroes on the allied side that are not going to the enemy side, they will get zero benefit from him overall. So I love to pair Scrag with Anoki because Anoki will keep heroes on the enemy side. I love pairing Scrag with Titus because it is very, very powerful. Titus will actually go to the mm -hmm. enemy side, provide crowd control. While Scrag is increasing his attack, he's doing his damage reduction, plus he's giving more energy to Titus. So pretty much a lot of heroes that will go onto the enemy side. Um, you have Lucrita goes over there, Wukong will go there. As long as you can push heroes back, Scrag will be super, super effective. Because also remember, when he is tanking heroes face-to-face, -face, he gets a nice buff as well um, with his face-to-face -face tanking, similar to Arthur, um, yeah, where he takes less damage. He takes 60% less damage um, when he is face-to-face -face with an enemy. Like I said, similar to Arthur, very, very powerful when he is in the mix, when he is face-to-face -face with other heroes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I find it really interesting because I usually, the thing that comes to my mind instantly is like a Thalia or heroes that go right away, but you actually mentioned heroes that push it, which I think is a very good way to approach it because that actually brings to my mind how, you know, in, in the early days, you said Brutus was king and I absolutely agree. And then Mollers kind of fell off. And now like the way of phrasing it, maybe we're seeing a resurgence, like them starting to be useful again for those newer players, even in chapter like 20 to 25 can actually maybe have a successful Molar account and having you obviously do a lot of factional accounts. I really wanted to get your opinion. What do you think about where Molars are now? Um, they're definitely headed in the right direction. The, the big problem that we've always seen with Molars was the crowd control aspect. So when you look, you have Falks and the Light Bearers, you know, you have Tassie, you have Namora, you have multiple heroes in the Wilders. For the Graveborn, you have Nara, which is great in crowd control. Um, you also do have Pharrell, who is super powerful. When it comes to the Maulers, the only one that we have is really Titus um, that can kind of mass crowd control heroes. Sophia does offer a stun. But overall, when it comes to being able to fear heroes, similar to like Pharrell's um, horrify ability, um, Titus is the only one. The problem that we have with Titus is with him being an agility hero, most of the time when he goes to the enemy side, he dies, which is a problem that AFK Arena has had kind of from the start. We've seen it with Thane throughout the years. We've seen it with um, Titus now. We've seen it with a lot of heroes like Kaz. Um, when they go to the enemy side, they die relatively quick because they are based on dodge. You cannot dodge magic in this game. Physical attacks can be dodged. Magic cannot be dodged, meaning that if they go over there versus a magic hero, um, such as Sophia, such as Belinda, um, Shamira, they die really, really fast when targeted by casters, which again, could be something that AFK Arena could address in the future. Um, maybe ma making them a little a little bit more survival survivable to magic. Because like I said, when they go on the enemy side, most of the times they die. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a lot of useful tips. And I want to, I actually want to wrap it up on one of the notes because I think I saw it on your channel that you said that the thing that drove you personally to make you make it yourself is all the useful tips you see. Uh, what's one thing that you've seen someplace else that you really like? What's a tip that you feel like uh, you've seen somewhere and you really want people to know? The big thing is really focusing on building specific heroes. We have a lot of guides. We have, you know, the 10 steps to making progression. Um, one, making sure that you are doing everything daily. You're doing all of your campaign progress. You're doing all of your quests. You're really going through the bounty board. I'm um, hitting up the Arcane Labyrinth every two days, pushing the King's Tower. The further that you make progression, the faster you make progression, 
with it being an AFK game, the more gold you get, the more hero EXP, the more player EXP you get, but also just planning. I, I mean, planning is really the big thing that mm -hmm. especially new players and veteran players, you have to build specific heroes um, to really, really perform to make progress it is planning on who you're building, what you're really looking for and what you're looking to get out of heroes. Um, but again, that is the reason I made the the faction accounts was to see heroes that people put in certain classes and see really how well they perform. So mm -hmm. even looking in PVP, looking in the tower, you know, they put uh, Torn is towards the bottom, um, Solus, Entendre is towards the bottom, Thane and Rain, um, a lot of players put towards the bottom. Mm -hmm. Seeing them max out, seeing them really develop, seeing them in gameplay, they actually perform pretty well, which is the reason why on the Light Bear account, I just built Rigby. Um, a lot of players have said Rigby is absolute garbage. Use him as fodder. <laughs> he's, he's in chapter 29 and he's performing really well. Didn't have any problems with him dying at all. Um, but like like I was saying, just, just planning. I, I mean, this game, the more you can plan, the more you can focus on heroes, knowing what you want to build, what team comps you want to build. Similar to the pay to win account, we went into this account building the Iran and Sophia combo. That is what started this day one. That was our 100% focus was the Sophia Iran combo. I had never used it. I had never built it, never seen how effective it has been. That combo alone has pushed us all the way to chapter 30 at this point. Um, through a majority of the stages was always that same exact combination of the heroes. The, the synergy is flawless between it. Might take a little bit of RNG to make it work, but it is very, very powerful when you get it to work. All right, so don't overlook those niche heroes and plan ahead. I think these are two very good notes. Hippo, I've been very happy to have you over here, and I'll be looking forward to do it again. Thank you, and thank you for having me, Linker.